Okay, recording has started. Welcome back everyone. This is the second hour of our lecture on BC106, Interpreting Scripture. All right, so now we're going to move into the this whole process of interpreting scripture, just break it down piece by piece. So uh, I'll be giving uh, many PDFs uh, as we talk about different aspects of, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole process of interpreting scripture. So first and foremost, when you and I are studying the Bible, most important is for us to depend on the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And that is some, that is where we start. So every time you read the Bible, in your heart, you're just praying a simple prayer, God, uh, help me understand, open my eyes. Like the psalmist prayed, right? Psalm 119, uh, he said, open thou my eyes, that I may see wonderful things out of your word. Um, so that's uh, Psalm 119 and verse 18. Right? Psalm 119, verse 18. Psalmist prayer, Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see wonderful things from your word. So that is our prayer, that every time we open up the Bible to read, um, every time we open up the Bible to read, every time we open up the Bible to study, in our heart, we just pray a simple prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Help me to see things I've not seen before. Right? So that's where we start. We start by depending on the Holy Spirit as our teacher, as our guide, right? So that's the first chapter, I mean, the first step in this whole process. I'm going to share the PDF, right? So this PDF is available. I've uh, put it out in the coursework section. So in biblical interpretation, first step is the illumination of the Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, and I, I'm not turning to all these verses, uh, you know, you could look them up uh, post the class. Uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. So the Holy Spirit is your teacher. So whenever you sit with the Bible, you welcome the Holy Spirit as your teacher. Right? And Jesus said, you know, in John 16, uh, that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will guide us into all truth. So Holy Spirit is your guide into all truth. So you and I don't have to be afraid. Yes, it seems like a very challenging task for us to make sure that we rightly divide the Word of God, but our first dependence is on the Holy Spirit, the author of the Scriptures. It's the Holy Spirit. Guide me to all truth. Where we don't understand, so Holy Spirit, help me to understand. Or help me to know the meaning, right? So we are very, our dependence is on the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Apostle John said, you know, in 1 John 2, 27, he said, uh, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and this anointing abides in you. And the same anointing teaches you of all things. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, he teaches you of everything. So you depend on him, even difficult topics. Holy Spirit, this topic seems difficult, but you teach me all things. You will teach me about everything, right? So depend on the Holy Spirit. He is the author, and so he is the best interpreter, right? So remember, he, the Holy Spirit, is the true author and the Holy Spirit is the true expositor or interpreter of the scriptures. Okay, so we dip it on. Now we understand the limitation of the natural man, right? So the natural man is, of course, the unsaved man is spiritually blinded. Second Corinthians 4 4. And the Apostle Paul said, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So even though they may be intellectually very sharp, spiritually they are blinded. 
right? That's the condition of the unsaved man. And also the natural man, Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, look, the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. So if we study the word of God just with, you know, as a natural man, you know, with the mind, the intellect, then of course, mentally, uh, you can under, people can understand the grammar and the meaning, but they're not going to be able to receive spiritual truth. You know, what, what does this mean about God? What does this mean about spiritual realities? And how does that connect to my everyday life? That, that gap is there. They can't understand it. Okay, so what I'm saying is, the natural man, or the man who is just using his natural abilities, right? He may understand the text. He may understand, of course, he will understand the text. He will understand the, the Hebrew and, the, and the, the meaning of the words and the, the grammar and the, what the, you know, the text, what it says, per se. But the spiritual truth behind it, the spiritual reality behind it, Paul said, can only be understood spiritually. It has to be spiritually discerned. That means there is something about your spirit that is connecting with the spiritual truth that is in the text. So there is the text, which we must understand correctly, of course, but then there is spiritual truth in the text, which can only connect to your born again spirit. Okay, so that is where, that is what we are trying to do. God, I want to understand the spiritual truth. I want to understand what, what, what does this say about God? What does this say about the ways of the spirit and so on, right? So that must be understood spiritually. Right? That spiritual understanding comes through the enlightening or the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So that is what we want. So Paul writes about this in Ephesians 1, 15 to 20. He prays for the Ephesians. He says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. That God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. So that's illumination. That means your born again spirit is now receiving spiritual truth given to you by the Holy Spirit, through the text, through the scriptures, right? So the Holy Spirit is the author. He inspired the writing of the scriptures and he is the illuminator. He gives you and me light. He illuminates it. That means he makes it come alive. He unveils the truth, spiritual truth that's contained in the scriptures. He speaks directly to you and to your situation. So that's what the Holy Spirit does, right? And uh, then you begin to receive insight. You begin to receive understanding. So we must depend on the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So he said, Lord, open my eyes. I, I'm going to do my part of uh, handling the text correctly and doing what I know, you know, I should do with the text. But while I'm working with the text, using my mind, God, I want revelation. I want the enlightening or the illumination that comes from the Holy Spirit to understand spiritual truth contained in the text. That's our prayer. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do for you and me as we depend on him. Okay? And when that happens, revelation enables you to see spiritual truth. I think a great example is in Matthew 16, you know, when Jesus, after he's been with his disciples for some time, he says, whom do men, whom do men say that I am? And of course, his disciples say, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. Uh, uh, you know, that means 
people are thinking this about you. They have these opinions about you. So that's the natural mind at work. Then Jesus turns around to them and says, but whom do you say that I am? And that must have taken them aback. Wow. And he's asking them a direct question. Whom do you say? Who do you think? What do you think? And at that very moment, Peter answers. He says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus tells him, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So that's revelation. Most people were looking at just the outside. They saw a man. They saw a Jew, a man who was a carpenter, who came, you know, who was doing carpentry. And they said, well, and he's doing wonderful things. He's teaching nicely. So maybe he's John the Baptist come back to life, or maybe he is Elijah, whatever. But Peter could say, you are Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And how did Peter know that? Jesus tells him. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. A father gave you a revelation. That means your eyes were open to see something beyond the natural. Right? So this is spiritual truth. And that's what happens to us. When the Holy Spirit illuminates the text, we are able to see the truth in the text. And that's what we want. Now, some things you must understand about revelation is just because we receive revelation in one area doesn't mean we'll receive revelation in all areas. It's a pro we have to learn in every area. For example, somebody may have revelation concerning, you know, divine healing, that God still heals the people. He still heals the sick. That healing is in the atonement. And so they may have a wonderful revelation on divine healing. And they are walking in that spiritual truth. But they may not have revelation concerning some other area. Example, maybe marriage. You know, they... They don't understand God's design for marriage, or may they, may, they may not know the you know the, the, the way to walk in, in in the blessing of marriage and so on. So just because somebody has revelation in one area doesn't mean we have revelation in all areas. What we should do is be slowly and steady, steadily study the Word of God concerning all the areas that matter to us and receive revelation in all areas. Let me go to the scriptures. What do the scriptures say about marriage? What do the scriptures say about, you know, the ministry of the Holy Spirit? What do the scriptures say about prophetic ministry? What does the scriptures say about, you know, walking in love and living with, uh, in harmony with other brethren? What does scripture say about the local church? So what we're doing is we are receiving revelation in all the areas that we need, that we are living, you know, in all areas of life. And we are receiving spiritual truth. Right? And this comes by continuing in the word. If you continue in the word, you will know, Jesus said. So how does knowing come? How does revelation come? We have to continue in the word, you know, so you... You're faithfully studying the word. You're faithfully listening to people who are teaching the word because that's God has put people to teach the word so that we could learn. And through them, revelation comes as well. So we, we are faithful. We continue the word. And then progressively, we begin to receive revelation in various areas of life. And we are able to walk in spiritual truth in all of those areas of life. And Jesus gave us a key about how we can receive more revelation, more spiritual truth. This is how God works. Jesus said in John 14, 21, 
whoever has my word and does them will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will and we will come and you know just I will come and I will reveal myself to him John 14 21 that means you have his word you do it you obey it then what happens he comes and he gives you more revelation he will reveal more of himself to you and me so for us to keep on growing in revelation uh, we must continue in the word and we must walk in obedience to the word so when god sees uh, that we are doing the things he's already revealed to us he's going to come and reveal more to us right so continue the word keep studying the word keep looking into the word and keep obeying the word and as we do these two things we are going to keep on receiving revelation that means the holy spirit is going to illuminate to us what is already there in the scriptures now in talking about this aspect of revelation or illumination especially in the spirit-filled charismatic pentecostal um, a sphere of the Christian church there has always been a problem the problem is that or the the challenge has been that many times the preachers who you know like ourselves who who are tradition who are you know come from the spirit field charismatic um, Pentecostal type of background we are accused of not being very good students of the word that we just go by inspiration or oh, God reveals something to me we just go we don't study we are not very balanced we you know we don't adhere to the scriptures very well and in some cases this has been justified in the sense that people generally just say god told me god told me i saw this and they don't even check their own understanding of scripture or they don't abide by the guidelines of interpreting scripture and so they come up with all kinds of wrong ideas uh, under the name of revelation or oh, god revealed this to me i was reading the bible and god revealed this to me well did you check that did you test it did you you know make sure that what you claimed as God's illumination or revelation is, is valid. So that is something, while we are depending on the illumination or revelation that comes from the Holy Spirit, we must also make sure that it is aligned, that what we think we are receiving is aligned, right? So some guidelines here. Right? To keep in mind when we are talking about the illumination of the Holy Spirit, Just because we are depending on the Holy Spirit, and which we are, the Holy Spirit is our teacher, it doesn't mean that my interpretations or one's interpretations are without error, infallible. I should never be that way. Right? I must be willing to let other people listen and judge what I'm saying. You know, so when we you know, for, for example, for example, suppose you're reading Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You see, in the very first chapter, Revelation chapter 1, I think, verse 4, John says he sees God the Father. Then he sees seven spirits before the throne. And then he sees Jesus. So the Holy Spirit, is represented by seven spirits and that word the term seven spirits is used often in revelation chapter one two three four and five seven spirits but it's only a language used to talk about the holy spirit before before the throne of god now somebody and this has happened in fact some well-known charismatic Christian leader in the charismatic circle 
at one point, and this was many years ago, came out with, uh, you know, there are seven Holy Spirits, seven spirits, because it says seven spirits. But that's only language used to represent the Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. But because in Revelation chapter 1 through 5, you find the phrase seven spirits used often. Uh, he came out with seven spirits, you know, preaching. It caused a lot of uh, disruption, you know, uh, in the church. Uh, and then he had to withdraw. Okay, that's that's not what it meant. He had to correct. But he was, a, you know, a well-established minister. So we have to be careful in our interpretations. Now, we are depending on the Holy Spirit, but when we study, we must follow guidelines. Right? So, and we must be willing to be corrected, that's willing to let other people listen to you and correct you. So it doesn't mean your interpretation is infallible, always check it, make sure it's right. Secondly, uh, the work of the Spirit does not mean that he gives some interpreters hidden meaning that is different from the normal literal meaning of the passage. If somebody stands up and says, you know, the Holy Spirit showed this and this to me, uh, it's hidden, some, it's in the scriptures, you're not seeing it, I can see it, uh, but it is going away from the literal meaning of the passage, then we have to be careful. Right? Uh, you know, one one uh, typical example is, I think, in the seventeenth chapter of Luke. Um, well, seventeenth. Let me just say, yeah, yeah. So somebody again. This is again a well-known charis preacher from the charismatic spirit field side. So he read Luke seventeen verses five to ten. And I think he still preaches this, but uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 5 to 10, where Jesus is talking about faith. You know, the disciples come and say, Lord, increase our faith. And then Jesus, Luke 17, 6, he says, you know, faith yeah, is like, if you have a faith as a mustard seed, you can tell it to move, tell the tree to move, it'll move. Then in verse 7, he talks about a servant who takes care of sheep. And so he came up with this teaching that, based on, you know, verse 7, 8, and 9, 7 through 10, just because it came right after Jesus' teaching on faith, he said, okay, so faith is a servant. Well, that is not what Jesus is teaching. You know, just because the scriptures are coming in that order doesn't mean that's how you interpret that. Right? No, he's just, Verse 5 and 6, he's talking about faith. And then he's talking about the fact that we have to walk in humility before God, that we just we do the things God's told us to do. That's how you interpret that, verse 7 to 10. Not saying faith is a servant and faith goes out and does work for you and comes back. And, you know, so that kind of a teaching came out in those days and maybe they're still teaching it today but you got to be very you know uh, that's not the actual meaning of that passage you know it's divergent from the normal literal meaning of the passage. i'm just giving examples and we'll talk about several different examples so you got to be careful you know just because we're saying holy spirit showed me well no what is the correct meaning of the passage so that's where you have to filter out, you know, what man is saying, even though they may say, you know, God showed me, God revealed to me, etc. Okay. Another important thing about illumination is that the Holy Spirit is helping us understand the Bible, but he's not going to normally give us sudden flashes in the scripture that is outside of the study of meditation, study and meditation. That means you know, we do have a part of study and meditation. And while you are studying and meditating, the Holy Spirit will illuminate. Sometimes, sometimes, 
So this is not normal, this is occasional. You may receive insight into a scripture that you have not been studying and meditating. What is the normal? The normal is you are doing your careful study and meditation and the Holy Spirit is bringing you insight. And there may be times, and uh, it usually happens if you're seeking God for some instruction and direction, he may, you know, highlight a passage of scripture that you've not thought of for a long time. Yeah, that happens. But he's not going to suddenly give you uh, something that, you know, a meaning of something, scripture that, no, that you've not been studying. The normal is, as you and I are studying and meditating, into that he's giving us meaning and revelation. Something that is disconnected, disjointed, taking out of context, you have to be very careful if you check it. Right? And lastly, the good part is the Holy Spirit guides all of us into all truth. He guides us into all truth. So yes, every believer can depend on the Holy Spirit to get into truth. And we must follow obediently. Okay. So just some understanding here on, on the illumination of the Holy Spirit and to keep it in perspective, right? Other, don't take it out of context. Don't, uh, you know, everything has to be tested. It has to be kept in, in its place. Otherwise, we have seen, especially from the spiritual, charismatic, Pentecostal church side, people, you know, go off into all kinds of things. And it comes out, they come up with all kinds of strange teaching and preaching and uh, because they're not following the proper rules. We do believe in the illumination of the Holy Spirit, but keep it in context, right? Let me pause here before I go to the next chapter to see if there are any questions here on the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Everyone with me so far? Any questions? Any Okay, um, please feel free to ask questions. You can type it in the chat or you can unmute your mic anytime, right? Don't hesitate. Uh, we'll be more than happy um, to do our best to answer questions. Let's move forward now to another aspect. So this is chapter five. Uh, I did not put out this PDF in the course work today. I didn't think we will reach here but right after this class um, um, after you know after my sorry I have one more class so after that I will upload this uh, this uh, PDF I'll put it out there so uh, culture and right? so another rule is this the we talked about the cultural gap right that that is there, that uh, the Bible was written in the cultural context. It is written by people. And it was in the cultural context of its day and time. Whereas today's culture is very different. Right? It's 2000 years or maybe more, 3000, 4000 years later. Our culture is very different. So we need to understand the cultural context. Right. So when in general, when we talk about context, meaning what are the surrounding factors that are affecting the text in which the text has to be understood? Right. So when we say context, we're talking about the verses before and after the paragraph and the book the time, the dispensation of the time in which it was written, the overall message of the Bible, and also the historical cultural environment when it was written. So the culture is also part of the context of in which the passage or the text has to be understood, right? So we need to pay attention to the culture 
in order to correctly interpret it and then to correctly translate that to our day and time. So when we talk about culture, what are the things that influence culture? So we can talk about the political situation, the religious situation, the economic, the legal, sometimes agricultural or architectural, clothing, domestic, geographical, military, social, all these things uh, are part of the culture. So as you're reading scripture, you'll find that, you know, uh, sometimes military, military terms are used. Uh, and then, then you have to go think back, okay, the reason they talk about a sword and a shield and a, and a spear or a belt or a breastplate is because that was what they were using in those days. And these are all military language. We don't use that today. You know, today, there are guns and <laughs> missiles and tanks. Uh, you don't find soldiers walking around with sword and shield and helmet. You know, I mean, generally, it's, it's very different, right? So when you read those passages, you have to understand he's, he's, he's using the, the, you know, whatever military equipment was available in those days, he's using that as part of the scripture, right? So uh, all these things come into play when we understand or we're trying to interpret scripture. Now, I'm just going straight to the rules here. What are some of the rules we must keep in mind? Some passages of the Bible are limited to that particular day by the cultural setting and therefore not transferable. You know, so you know, we have to identify that. And um, if the if what is being in that passage, if it is relevant to that day and culture, then we don't, it's not transferable to our culture. For example, in Ruth the fourth, I mean, these are just examples. In Ruth chapter four, verse eight. If, um, so it was a practice in Bible times during that time that when two people came to agree, and this was specifically in uh, the sale of uh, a land or a house. When two people said, okay, when person A is selling his house to person B, and they have agreed on the terms of the sale, then person A should will take off his sandal and give it to person B. That's a sign that they have agreed to the terms for the sale of the house. So that was practiced in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So question, do we practice that today? Is that the way we sell a house today? No. Today you want to sell a house or a house, you have a legal document. Um, you have a sale deed. Uh, that has to, you know, that you have to go and legally sign and it has all the T's and then the sale happens. Nobody takes off well, his sandals and gives it to the other person. So what do we say? Well, we say that that is a practice. Even though it's in the Bible, it was a practice for that day and time. And it is not something that we practice today. It's in the Bible, but it's a, it, is a, it has a cultural setting and it is limited to that cultural setting and therefore it is not transferable to our culture. That means we don't practice that today. This one example, right? And so like this, you will find uh, many things in the Bible. So we just distinguish them as permanent. That means, yes, we practice this today. 
and temporary. That means it's in the Bible, but that practice was restricted to just that day and time. So we need to distinguish that. Otherwise, if something that's temporary, you try to force it on people today, it'll cause a lot of problems. So you can just look at a simple list of things. And I've just put uh, a few things today, a uh, few uh, a list of few things, and it's all from scripture. And here you can say whether it's permanent or whether it's temporary. Right? So let's go to this. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So Romans chapter 16, verse 16. The Apostle Paul said, you know, he's closing off his letter to the church in Rome. And he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. So would this be something permanent? That means every church and every part of the world has to follow and every believer has to follow or is this temporary that means this was written specifically to the church in rome yes it is in the new testament yes it's part of the epistle to the romans but it's temporary and it's cultural it has a cultural context so every believer does not have to practice it what do you think is number one permanent or is number one temporary Yeah, right. So, so number one would be what we would refer to as a temporary thing, right? It's not a permanent thing. It was given to them in their culture, and it was for them. Right? It's not something we have to practice today. It's not like every believer has to do it, right? Uh, in some cases we greet each other by a shake hand hand handshake we shake hands and that's our way of greeting in some places we may hug each other that's our way of greeting in some places you give a high five <laughs> that's uh, that's another way of greeting it's not like every believer has to do this so that's why we say that's temporary okay look at number two abstain from meat sacrificed to idols do we have to follow it abstain from meat sacrificed to idols do we eat food that is sacrificed to idols so would this be temporary or would this be permanent what what would you say oh uh Sorry, is that permanent or is that temporary? Just say it in your mic because I'm not. I think it is permanent. We shouldn't eat idol uh, food served to idols. Correct. Right. So, yes. So this is a permanent thing in the sense that uh, we don't eat food offered to idols. The only exception would be what Paul wrote in First Timothy chapter 4 where he said, look, when you go to the market or when you go to the store, uh, you just buy what is in the store because we don't know, you know, uh, what they have. Let's say, suppose you go to the market and buy your meat or you buy your chicken or whatever. Uh, we don't know what the people have done. So you just buy the food. You don't worry about it. You bring it home, you cook it, you pray it and eat, right? So if the butcher had prayed to his idol before killing the whatever animal, we don't know. And we wouldn't be worried about it because Paul said everything is from God and is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. But in general, if somebody brings us something that's offered to an idol and says this is offered to an idol, we say, no, I, I don't worship the idol. I, I would avoid it. But sometimes if you eat it accidentally or you eat it without knowing, we are not worried. We have prayed, we are safe, but we don't worship the idol by uh, uh, receiving food to idols. Being baptized, 
permanent. All right, we know that's permanent. Uh, washing one another's feet. So Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Does that mean every time we go to church, we have to wash each other's feet? So is that temporary? Is that permanent? It could be permanent metaphorically talking. I don't know. But... Mm. Uh, it's um, so what we would say is it's permanent in its principle. The principle is transferable. The practice is not right. The practice of washing one another's feet. It's not uh, something uh, we all are forced to do, but the principle is transferable. So that's another thing you must keep in mind. What is the principle? The principle is we serve one another. So that is transfer. We follow that. But do we always have to wash each other's feet physically? No. Right? So there is the practice. There is the principle. The principle is transferable. Practice is, uh, is temporary. Uh, Pastor, yeah. Ask, Go ahead. In verse uh, uh, 14, we also... Uh, I'm just reading from NIV. Mm -hmm. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see in some churches, especially in Kerala, they have this culture of uh, um, washing each other's feet, especially during Good Friday and those times. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it's not needed is what we are understanding, right? Yes, yes. So... Jesus gave us an example. Now, if some somebody does it, it's fine. You know, I remember when I was traveling in Ecuador once, I was ministering there. They they forced me and my wife. They forced us to sit down. I was so embarrassed, but it the people wanted to do it. They said, "No, we want to wash your feet." Uh, and this was the first time. And I just I said, okay, you know, I, I personally didn't want them to do it, but they forced, you know, you have to sit down, you have to wash your feet. Then I said, okay, then I have to wash your feet, you know, but it wasn't, it was, it was not a practice. It was not something you do all the time. At that moment, if somebody wants to do something, okay. It's a temporary thing, but the principle is, we wash one another's feet by serving people, loving them, serving them. That's how we are, right? All right, let's uh, try to cover the rest. Number five, mm, right hand of fellowship. So what is that? Permanent. Yeah. So, you know, so it's like we said, uh, it is an expression of uh, fellowship, uh, yeah. Be and again here it's only a um, it's a what do you say it's a figure of speech that means we extend fellowship to each other. Number six, ordained by the laying of hands. Do we practice that in the church today? Permanent. Yes, right. We still practice that. We lay hands on people and we ordain them. Number seven, prohibit women from speaking in the church assembly. So do we let people speak, women preach, um, speak in the church assembly? I know this can be debatable. Uh, temporary. It was, uh, yeah. it was temporary, it was cultural. Yes, correct, right? So it's temporary, right? He was addressing the situation in Corinth. Having fixed hours of prayer, do we all have to pray at three o'clock in the afternoon? or that was just the practice by the apostles. They, they had their own, you know, they had their own time of prayer. So they went in the, went for prayer. You can pray anytime, whenever. Number nine, do we sing spiritual songs, uh, songs, hymns, spiritual songs? Yes, permanent. Yes. So we do that today. We do sing. This one is easy. Abstain from eating blood. Permanent. Yeah, right? So we don't do that. Now, in some cultures, 
in some cultures. Uh, um, it is part of their diet to eat blood, you know, and uh, again, I'm not just singling out, but in certain Asian cultures, they do that. You know, uh, it's part of their diet. They don't think anything bad about it. They, um, they, 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 they process it in a certain way. They add another, they coagulate it, and then they do something with it. And they eat it as part of their diet. Now, uh, and uh, maybe, I, I don't know the full context, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's probably a source of whatever food, part of their food. Now, suppose some of them become believers. Are we going to force them to change their diet? What would we do? You know, when they come to Acts 15, we will let them make their decision. You know, okay, it's there in the scriptures, but maybe that's their food, that's their diet. Then when they encounter the word of God, they can make their choice, but we are not going to force everybody. We're not going to say, you know, you have to stop this in order to get saved. No, let them get saved through the grace of Jesus Christ and then let God deal with that, which is now they're part of their normal uh, life you know it's it's what it's, they don't think anything wrong so so uh, number 11 slaves obey your masters or we would translate it to our modern day as employees obey your employers so we would say that still works uh, lord supper yes i'm just going a little fast because uh, of time yes we observe the Lord's Supper. Um, do not make any oaths. Yes, we do that. Circumcision, of course, is a temporary thing. Wearing sandals, but not an extra tunic. That was a temporary thing. It was an instruction given to them. And then casting lots for church officers. That's also a temporary thing. Okay? So... Um, I know I, I rushed through the last few things, but do you all, are you, is everybody okay with this? Any questions, any doubts? Yeah, we are all in agreement. Okay, so Everything this is, is okay, good. So this is just a simple example, or, you know, a small example, like, and like this, there are many things in the Bible which when we read, uh, we will have to determine, is it temporary, is it permanent, okay? Uh, and we will finish this next next class. I, I know we're short of time, I have to close. We'll come back to this and finish it next class, okay? Uh, let's, uh, let's close. So, oh, I see a comment here, Zelitoli. Okay, part of Naga culture, they do eat blood, okay, yeah. All right. So let us uh, close. We will continue this next week and get into more, more things that will help us uh, interpret scripture, okay? Uh, could somebody please pray and then we will dismiss. Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for this morning, teaching us on the interpreting the scriptures. Lord, Help us, Lord, that we may understand the scriptures according to the context and in relation to the culture in, in which it is spoken. And also, Lord, as you study your word, grant us the illumination and revelation of their word. Father, we thank you for what is taught. It may remain in us whenever we read your word. You may understand it rightfully according to what is intended by you, so that we may receive the full blessing of your word and that we may be able to divide the world rightfully and teach others also. As we journey through this course, teach us more, Lord, in the coming days. We thank you for the pastor. We commit a very wonderful in hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, please have your break and then you can go to your next class. God bless you. I'll see you again next week. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor.